So the agenda for today is, I'm just going to be moderating the, deba the debate. This was kind of an on-the-fly situation where uh, my colleague from iDefense, Ankizis Morais, was supposed to be giving this presentation, but he is ill today, so I am filling in. Um, so I'd like to first, we're going to start out by asking the participants on the panel if you could please just introduce yourself a minute to tell us who you are and what you do. Okay, I'm Philippe. I gave a talk earlier on uh, SS7 security for P1 security. Uh, I'm involved with uh, this kind of uh, issues regarding the governments that want to scan their telecom network before uh, other intelligence services, uh, select few that has the capability to take out telecom networks before the local government. So basically the issue is governing uh, in a good direction the security effort of their local telecom operators. My name is Anderson Ramos. Eu trabalho, é, eu tenho na realidade uma empresa de treinamento especializada em cursos de segurança da informação personalizados. É, eu trabalhei, a, essa empresa foi aberta recentemente, a gente trabalha basicamente com clientes grandes e na realidade eu trabalhei já, já trabalho há vários anos com formação de treinamento, capacitação de profissionais em segurança da informação. Além da empresa, é, eu trabalho também como instrutor, eventualmente, para outras organizações, mas a, a organização para a qual eu trabalho mais frequentemente é o ISC ao quadrado, que é a instituição da certificação CISP, SSLP, etc. I'm Josh. I work with uh, Fretwork Technologies. It's my own security consultancy um, for a lot of clients in the U.S. and in Europe. Uh, it can range from technical consulting all the way up to due diligence kind of work. And uh, in some of the projects I've worked on in the last year, I've um, done some uh, work kind of evaluating what various countries are doing in terms of their um, critical infrastructure protection and, and cyber strategies. I'm Andrew Cushman, uh, former director of the Microsoft Security Response Center. Uh, you may have seen my talk a few minutes ago. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll see if, whether I have anything of value to contribute today. I'm sure you will. <laughs> okay, so the agenda for today is I'm just going to give a brief introduction of the topic. Um, this is a slide deck that I presented, so it kind of represents some of the things that I'm interested in on this topic. Um, so I'm going to try to go through really quickly, bear with me as I flash through this. And um, from there, I'm going to pose a question to the panel. And um, we're going to try to be quick with that as well, because the priority here is we would really like to open the floor for questions and invite participation from the audience. Um, so as I think many people in this room are probably already well familiar, um, Various militaries around the world have become increasingly interested in integrating cyber capabilities, attack, like hacking type attack capacity into their defense strategies. Um, in the US at least, military officers, officers have come to describe it as kind of the fifth domain of warfare. So we have of course land, sea, air, space, and now they're looking and emphasizing that we have to look now at the sort of the cyber sphere or the connection between people and machines as the fifth domain of warfare. Um, this is a very controversial topic and um, I think that all of us have kind of opinions about whether or not that's actually the case. Um, I would argue that to date, we haven't really seen a cyber attack that rises to the level of an act of war. We have seen examples that people love to point to and quote um, as justification for integrating cyber capacity into defense strategy, but we haven't really seen anything yet that rises to the level of an act of war. So in terms of justifications, people love to bring up the uh, July Korea attacks, and I put Korea here in quotes for um, reasons that we won't get into, uh, mainly for attribution reasons. The Korea attacks, although they got a lot of attention, they were, they were pretty low level. And I would say that the analogy is it's better to call it more of a noisy demonstration than 
any kind of major attack. Um, people also frequently reference Estonia and Georgia. Um, and in the case of the attacks with Estonia and Georgia, they were, of course, part of larger conflicts. It wasn't just the attack in cyberspace uh, in and of itself. It was part of a much larger conflict. And in terms of the actual computer attacks that happened with those, there were none of the negative results that we typically associate with warfare. No casualties, no loss of territory, destruction, etc. cetera. Um, so as I think that you can tell just by sort of my inflection and tone on this, I think that there's a lot of hype about this issue. I think that it's, it is a real question that ne we need to talk about and address. But the way that it's treated in the media is very simplistic. And the way that it's treated in government, at least at high level, um, it's, mo it's a lot of people who their jobs are more political, more policy focused. And when you get to the really high levels, the people involved in the issues might not necessarily have the familiarity needed to, to really understand what's at hand and what is possible. Um, a few examples of the sort of the hype we've seen is the, the obsessive focus on SCADA attacks, um, the focus on ICS or industrial control system attacks. Um, most recently, I think everyone in the audience here is familiar with the CBS report that focused on Brazil. Um, feel free to bring that up in your questions to the panel. I think it's a very interesting issue. Um, another example of this, the sort of hype that we're seeing is uh, what I would argue has been, at least in the American issue, in the American media, largely a kind of a FUD campaign. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the acronym FUD, Fear, Uncertainty, and Doubt. Um, it is a real issue, but th the way that it's being treated in the, in the media, at least, for example, I think it was a week ago or two weeks ago, the Wall Street Journal released an article um, with the FBI discussing that they felt pretty strongly that terrorists were integrating cyber capacity into their strategy. Um, these are examples of what I consider FUD. Um, but in spite of all this hype that we've seen in the media from government officials, I think it's pretty hard to de deny that most states are, in fact, developing their capabilities. They're investing a lot in this issue and have devoted f much more attention to it. So even though it, uh, there's a lot of hype going on, it's, it's real, it's happening. Um, just to see what exactly is happening, for example, I'm just going to go through three countries and talk at a very high level about their strategies. In the U.S., we opened the Cyber Command. Um, the estimated cost of that is $5 billion. Civilian government spending in the U.S. is estimated at about $6 billion. Um, I think we're going to see it increase substantially over the next few years. Um, the intelligence agencies are investing a lot in this. DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, they also, they announced, I believe it was in October, that they're going to be hiring about 1,000 new hires. They're probably not going to hire that many, they said, but the idea of 1,000 is just to demonstrate priority for the issue. Um, and defense contractors, that is private companies that contribute to the defense community in the U.S. and offer services to the military and the Pentagon, um, they're expanding their service portfolios to con include offensive capacities. Um, Going through really quickly, I want to get through the slide deck so we can turn to our participants. In the UK, um, they're also talking a lot about developing offensive capacities. Um, it was very controversial when Lord West, a minister in the UK, announced that he wanted to hire naughty boys to work at GCHQ. GCHQ is government communications headquarters. It's the Signals Intelligence Agency in the UK. and. He generated a lot of laughter and controversy when he said that he wanted to hire former black hats and, as he called them, naughty boys, to get involved in his offensive uh, cyber warfare effort efforts. I think this is a good demonstration of sort of when you get to the higher levels of government, the, the lack of understanding and the lack of nuance that sometimes occurs. Um, GCHQ has done a lot over the past month. They, um, their staffing is low, but they're increasing. I think it, right now they have 
in the teens, under 20 employees, but they are growing. And um, the police in the United Kingdom also has new authority to, to own anyone suspected of terrorism. Um, and like in the US, they're also talking about implementing a cyber czar. Uh, moving on, South Korea, kind of the same situation. They're rushing the, um, the 4th of July attacks have really sort of pushed Korea to, or South Korea to accelerate their program. Um, major spending, training initiatives, uh, and so forth. Um, I don't want to take up too much time here, so the list goes on. I mean, I'm not even going to go into the subject of Russia, China, kind of the usual suspects, as I'm sure many of you know here. Um, Brazil has also developed its own. Um, they have their own official strategy. We tried to get some Brazilians involved in that, um, specifically someone in the Marines to participate in this debate, but he was not authorized to do so by his um, by his boss. Uh, NATO is also pushing for building up their capacity. Um, and interestingly, um, I know this because we have someone at iDefense who participates pretty actively in the NATO initiatives, and we've been talking about partnering with them. And uh, my colleague has been really impressed just with the extent to which the NATO initiatives are moving much faster than a typical NATO initiative. So they're very interested in this topic as well. Um, nonetheless, even though there's a lot happening right now, I think the issue is it's th remains the situation where it's if, for those of you who are familiar with the analogy of the blind man and the elephant, so it's a man who can't see and he's feeling an elephant, but because he's blind and because the elephant is so big, he can't tell exactly what it is. It's, it's very ambiguous. And um, I think that James Lewis, I have a quote from him here, makes a really good point. Um, he says, we are in, in our thinking about the relationship of cyber conflict to security, where we were in the early 1950s concerning strategic th thinking on nuclear weapons. Um, this is an interesting point, and I would agree with it. I think that we're at a very nascent stage in terms of our strategic thinking. Um, and although this is true, it does overstate the destructive capacity of so-called cyber weapons. Uh, nonetheless, it's a really good point. Um, just to close here, there's a couple topics that really interest me and in my research at iDefense that I wanted to bring up. And I think that our panelists will um, have some interesting comments on. The first is the, the sort of what I call the public-private problem. And this is, um, it's become kind of a mantra among officials in the US. Whenever they talk about the problem of how are we going to confront the idea of any kind of cyber attack on our critical infrastructure. The solution is always, we're going to partner with the private sector. All of our critical infrastructure lies in the private sector, and therefore, through partnering and information sharing and hand-holding, this will be our solution. Um, so I'm really interested in that topic. I think it's extremely problematic, and I'm interested to hear what our panelists have to say about that. Um, another thing that concerns me and I find really interesting is I think that a lot of the conversation about this idea of cyber warfare and people getting up like I'm doing right now and discussing the issue or talking to the press um, and these governments that I've discussed and, and many others building up their cyber warfare capacity, what happens is you it initiates a kind of arms race dynamic where whether or not there's a need for this, it's, it's like the Cold War um, where you don't really know what's happening so you're building up your defensive capacity and it just, I think that we're at the beginning of stages of what could become an arms race. Um, so I'd like to pose a question first just to give the panelists an opportunity to kind of bring forward their opinions on the issue. You can address my question or you can uh, you can bring up whatever you um, would like to, to bring forward. Um, and then from there, we're going to invite questions from the audience because, as I said, that's really the priority for this discussion. Um, so I think my question for the panel um, 
is just what interests me is everyone here is, I think, rep not necessarily on this panel representing a private company, but works in the private sector and works for a company. And um, I'm just interested in, like, why would we have a panel of all people in from the private sector? And, you know, this is, in, in many ways, it is a government issue, but um, the idea of software vendors and um, companies that are critical infrastructure holders are, are really critical to this issue. So I'd just like to hear the panelists comment a bit about um, what they think the role of the private sector is on this issue. Um, feel free to comment on that or whatever else you'd like to bring up. I'd like to start with Philippe. All right. Uh, one thing that uh, I can tell about is uh, the strange dynamics that happen uh, when you when you deal with this kind of issue. Uh, most of the time, we don't talk directly to government. We when when we talk about uh, telecom security, for example, we talk to some big corporation, which are big consulting corporation or research, uh, government oriented, like Mitre or McKinsey or this kind of contractor. And then uh, suddenly we start to see appearing uh, government documentation that say in much more, uh, I'd say, obscure terms exactly what we said. So basically there's a workflow where we talk to some consultants that are uh, mandated by the government, and then they translate that to government compatible talk, and then the government uh, writes even a version based on that, and then it gets back into our hands, and then we have to comply with what we said earlier, but in a broken way because it's uh, written by bureaucrats. Bu bureaucrats. Okay, um, that's a very uh, ironic way of looking at it. At the same time, it ensures a process that they feel confident with in order to enforce whatever policies they want to do. Uh, now, what we see is the force of proposition is coming from the private sector, and the problem is also coming from the private sector. Because uh, basically, the kind of infrastructure that we are trying to secure is private sector. It's a uh, national telco. There's, let's say, from three to five of them. In some countries, there's one, and then it's uh, more uh, typically um, governmental infrastructure and not really separated as a private entity. But yet, then even in that case, even in the case where we're dealing with third world countries which d didn't separate uh, their national telco into a private entity, then there's a question of who provided the equipment. Basically, uh, when you're dealing with regional um, capability of one neighbor country to take out, to crash the phone network of another country, uh, the question is what kind of equipment came from which uh, origin? Because there's two ways to, to go for uh, disrupting uh, the, the phone system. One is to have an O-day, if you will, um, for the phone system. And the other one is to have backdoored some kind of equipment with, let's say, uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, this is a vulnerability and we did not know about it. So basically, still, the private sector is still very well included in, into, into this issue. And actually, it seems like the government is trying to get a hand into it, but they don't even have very often the capability to view the problem and to view the state. So, um, of course, they, they contract then some, some entities, but it has to be encapsulated and formatted. So that's why we end up talking with these big corporations that have the habit of dealing with the government. Thank you, Philippe. É, o, eu vou é, falar na realidade um pouco mais a respeito do que eu tenho mais contato, que é a parte de é, capacitação, né? O que, que eu e um pouco o que, que eu acho como é que esse tema vem sendo tratado no Brasil. Eu acho que pela história recente do Brasil, a gente passou de um período de é, passamos por um período de ditadura e depois que ocorreu a democratização do país, se você pegar os últimos 16 anos, você teve o país administrado diretamente por pessoas que foram é, perseguidas diretamente por esses regimes. Então, eu acho que logo após a ditadura, é, começou a acontecer no Brasil meio que um sucateamento gradual das Forças Armadas. Né? Talvez por um medo em relação ao que houvesse acontecido, é, as Forças Armadas elas foram sistematicamente perdendo recurso ao longo dos anos. Né? Então, sem entrar também num, num julgamento de valor a respeito é, desse tema, o que aconteceu, eu acho que esse sucateamento chegou num determinado ponto que está claro que não beneficia o país mais. Né? Então, chegamos numa situação onde é, parece que o país tem bases democráticas é, 
relativamente sólidas, né? principalmente se contar o nosso histórico recente. E eu acho que vive-se um momento no Brasil de se perguntar qual que é o papel do Exército Brasileiro dentro dessa nova realidade brasileira. Né? A gente, eu tenho a, a impressão que o Brasil, a gente passou muito tempo acostumado ao fato de que o Brasil era a capital mundial da simpatia, né? parafraseando uhum. uma frase de um artigo que eu li é, é, numa revista, infelizmente eu não lembro o nome da pessoa que disse, mas que... É, com o crescimento econômico que o Brasil vem é, é, enfrentando, é, passando recentemente, né, tá, tendo cada vez mais é, projeção internacional numa série de temas, eu acho que fica muito óbvio que é, o Brasil passa a exigir, como país, o Brasil passa a exigir mais espaço nessa nova ordem mundial. Então, a gente vê, uh, independente das orientações ideológicas, é, desde o, no, nos últimos 16 anos, nas duas últimas gestões, o Brasil vem sistematicamente tentando aumentar esse papel dele dentro desse cenário internacional e exigir estar é, tá mais, tá mais no centro das decisões. Né? Uh, eu acho que, é, quando isso acontece, é natural que os países que estão perdendo espaço, eles não queiram entregar esse espaço tão facilmente. Uma coisa natural, ninguém quer perder os benefícios que tem. E eu acho que é um país novo que cresce, que começa a fazer demandas de, 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 de liderança em certos aspectos. Eu acho que isso incomoda, de certa forma. Então, por conta disso, eu acho que tem que se fazer uma pergunta a respeito de qual que é o papel das Forças Armadas do Brasil dentro desse novo contexto. Né? E a visão que eu tenho, eu é, já tive a oportunidade de treinar diversas pessoas, aqui do Exército Brasileiro, do Exército de outros países, ou mesmo da OTAN, que foram mencionadas aqui. Né? E, é, ou seja, no geral, são treinamentos cobertos por acordos de confidencialidade, ou seja, os detalhes, assim, eu acho que não é uma coisa... É, que a gente deva comentar, mas sim as informações que são públicas e que são, na realidade, informações, como ele falou, a questão dos burocratas que tomam as decisões. Né? Então, a gente acho que é de conhecimento de todos que faz alguns anos que vem se desenvolvendo um novo plano de defesa para o Brasil, um plano de rearmamento, um plano de... É, não se fala rearmamento, né? se fala é, reparação do potencial bélico do Brasil, mas, no geral, é o quê? É comprar arma, né? basicamente. E, e eu vejo que esse tema é tratado de maneira muito... Você pode ver, quer dizer, o Brasil quer construir um submarino, o Brasil é, quer terminar de construir o um submarino, o Brasil está terminando... É, é, né, Especula-se que o Brasil já tem controle é, a respeito de várias técnicas de enriquecimento de urânio e o quanto isso significaria que o país estivesse próximo de produzir uma bomba. É, a gente vê investimento em porta-aviões, caças, etc. Porém, é, se você pegar esses planos e ler uma detalhada, você, é, vocês vão perceber, na realidade, que nesse sentido muito pouca coisa é feita. Né? Então, eu acho que, na realidade, deveria haver muito mais investimento e o Exército deveria estar mais próximo na sociedade no sentido de ter um papel social, né? ou seja, receber recursos do governo e, a partir desses recursos recebidos, esse tipo de investimento, essa nova tecnologia que é desenvolvida possa ser compartilhada com o setor privado, ou seja, que o Exército poderia adotar um papel de proeminência nesse sentido. Excelente. Thanks, Anderson. Uh, we're going to turn the mic to Josh. And Josh, I know that you uh, you definitely have opinions about the role of, and also the concerns of the private sector. I mean, why should companies care about cyber warfare? Well, uh, one comment I wanted to make on the whole public-private partnership thing was that most of those, most people I've talked to, they're involved in public-private partnerships on the private side. Uh, they tend to feel it's like a one-way deal. They tend to give a lot and present a lot to their government counterparts and they don't feel like they get a lot back in return. So after a while they say, it was a good idea when we started, but I feel like we give and give and give and when we ask for something in return, it's kind of like, um, we can't talk about what we're doing. Okay. So that's just uh, one collective opinion I've had. But um, in the work I did in the last year, it's ended up being a lot of like due diligence for one of the clients I had in sp uh, specifically over in Europe. And, um, I think in the last year, and this was, uh, fortunately, it was, it was underscored by a report that uh, McAfee just put out about a week and a half ago, and they talk about the trends and the motivations of hackers. And it used to be the hobby hackers, they did it for fun. And then it kind of got into the financial gain motivation. Uh, people were trying to do this to steal money or identities and whatnot. 
And they said, now there's a noticeable trend uh, of political objectives. And so if you want to lump political objectives in with cyber warfare, you know, you can round that up or down however you want. But um, the company I was doing work for, they were very interested in the critical infrastructure protection that various countries had in place. So offensively and defensively, what, what did they have in place? Is it, if we're going to do business, they do managed uh, security services. So their business depends on being able to connect to their clients in that country through the internet because they pull all their data and aggregate it and filter it and, and do what they do with it. So if you have a situation like uh, Estonia or Georgia where there's a complete denial of service going on against a country, they can't reach their clients, so they can't do business, so their casualty is not bodies, but it's they're losing money and they're, they're breaking their service level agreement with that company. So now they, as part of the due diligence that I was doing, they said, you know, we'd also like to get some assessment data on where this country's at with critical infrastructure protection. Do they have government-sponsored initiatives, a CERT team? Do their ISPs coordinate? Is there anything in place so that if they get attacks like this, that there's something beyond the borders of their client's network that are going to help them? And offensively, do they have the ability to look back and try and find out who's doing this to them and resist that? Um, so it's been a very interesting uh, year as you talk to various countries. A lot of them are in, in Europe, in Eastern Europe. and. Some are just on the fringes. A lot of people are trying to do something defensively. They haven't thought through the offensive side yet. They're kind of on the uptake of that. But just for uh, just doing business, it's just a straight uh, risk calculation. Uh, is it going to cost us the same? If this country has no cyber awareness at the governmental level, what's the cost of us doing business in that country and trying to maintain internet connectivity with our clients versus you know someplace else that's got those type of capabilities in place. So it's, it factors into their business model. So they're more and more businesses are becoming keenly aware of, um, I guess, state-sponsored programs and political hacking that could go on and, and disrupt whatever they have in those countries. Because a lot of the, <clears throat> you, you guys probably know if, if you read the, the post-mortem on some of these things like Estonia and Georgia's, especially in Estonia, they didn't just attack government sites, they attacked business sites and banks and things too and tried to shut down banks and whatnot, so there were businesses that were involved, there were private sector businesses involved in this as well, not just um, attacking government websites and things like that. So uh, it's on the radar, I guess, of, of uh, companies that uh, depend on connectivity for their business. Uh, it'll probably get more so, I guess, so. Yeah, thanks, Josh. I think the, the question of business continuity is, it's something that doesn't very often come up in this debate, but it, it's clearly very important, especially because a, an attack might be targeted at, at one target, but it has the potential to bleed over. And so I think it's a very interesting and important to bring up the, the business continuity issue. I want to turn the, um, the mic over to Andrew and hear what you have to say. Thanks. Uh, First of all, I, I guess I'll start by saying that I think uh, applying labels like cyber warfare or cyber terrorism uh, is uh, a red herring. <laughs> kind of, uh, it, it takes the conversation in the wrong direction and it doesn't really focus on the problem. Uh, my job in the MSRC was twofold. It was about risk analysis and then it was about risk management. So uh, what I think is that today, countries, companies, individuals are facing, uh, a, a, there is a new risk because of the dependence on uh, computers that manifests itself. Uh, and so I think that rather than talk about it in terms of cyber warfare, talk about it in terms of the threat. So there now is the ability for either a state or a company or an individual to essentially disable large parts of society because, of, because they run on computers. And uh, to the question of why would there be a public-private partnership? Because private companies and private individuals are motivated to keep the internet up are motivated to keep uh, the electronic control systems that uh, control power or water functioning. I like to take a shower in the morning. <laughs> I think we all do. <laughs> uh, 
uh, and so the, the change there really is that uh, the threat and the risk is, is, has changed and we don't have effective uh, risk management strategies or uh, tactics for, for dealing with that. So, uh, and then when thinking of the, the other real change here is that it's, it's not the, one of the other problems with applying a label like cyber terrorism or cyber warfare is that you think, oh, that's a big nation state that's doing that. Well, it, it is true, but it only takes one person and about five machines to actually DDoS uh, something. You know, if you want to go DDoS Estonia, it's not really going to take <laughs> very many machines. You, you could go rent a botnet and a week later, uh, you know, or you could go rent a, a, a kit for 40 bucks and a week later you could have enough bots to go DDoS your favorite whatever. Um, I, so it's really focused in on the, uh, the how do we go and manage these threats. We don't actually know how to go do that today. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. I thank you for bringing up the point of the use of the terminology of cyber warfare and cyber terrorism being this kind of red herring that distracts from the real issue because people really focus on that. I, I appreciate you bringing that up because it's a, it's a very good point and I agree with that. I would like to open the floor now for questions. Does any, is, would anyone like to present a question to the panelists? Uh, please, and I would point out, I invite you to ask your questions in English or Portuguese. Uh, I have a question. Uh, we saw that uh, the presentation about the kernel, that uh, the design of the kernel is the most important thing. Uh, it doesn't matter really if Linux is more developed, uh, but uh, other platforms uh, have long-term uh, strategies. Uh, we see, we, we can saw in cyberspace that we can multiply resources easily. But uh, there's a thing that we cannot multiply or buy. That is this time. I have some time to plan my strategy. And uh, in, in a simple way, I can, I can resume the, that uh, the problem is a problem of strategies, of design. Does anybody want to take that, Philippe? Actually, uh, I would uh, then re uh, agree with Andrew and take his point. Uh, when you deal with people who are in government and uh, taking care of well, these subject, they never speak about warfare. That's something you don't speak about. And it, even a few years ago, it was not really a good way to use the term offensive in any kind of talks that you have with them. So what is it about is bringing the awareness in their structure. Um, recently, at some conference, I was speaking about Hack Labs and how it uh, would uh, benefit some countries uh, to have Hack Labs for the hacker uh, community of this country. And people came after the talk, and some of these people were from the federal police and federal military of that country, and said, well, we needed two in our military organization, and the reason of this is to give awareness. So we are not even speaking about strategy, we're speaking a step before that. It's awareness of what people can do and what is available so that the people get informed from independent source. Because the main problem we're facing here is that these governments don't trust anyone, and even they have trust issues within their uh, organizations. So uh, the thing is how to build organic knowledge from within that will get them into having the good approach and then the good strategy. So really we are at the beginning of this question. And where, where I'm seeing evolve strategy, it means that it's already capable of having the offensive side. And then they really, we really speak about um, the dogma and the, uh, the, the strategy of, of such component, be it military or governmental. 
Great, thanks, Philippe. Um, I'd like to kind of keep this going. So instead of having each panelist address this question, unless you have very strong feelings about it, in which case you can tell me, um, I'd like to continue with the question. So I saw a question here in the fourth row. Do you, would you like to come on up? Oh, it's not exactly a question, but mainly it's a point uh, to consider in the, during the, the debate. Uh, cyber warfare debates are usually... Cyber, cyber. Oh, oh, oh. Well, uh, this kind of discussion is usually about uh, targeting the civil population. Uh, what about targeting the weapons? Because uh, uh, recently, the getting uh, a lot of computing in, uh, on weapons. There are a lot of prototypes about auto. Uh, remote controlled weapons, about automated weapons, uh, even I saw a, a bizarre but funny article about a weapon that could uh, be moved using dead bodies and another kind of organic material. So what about the, the cyber warfare uh, as a, a resource to, to target? military weapons and then start to get really casualty like imagine if I could exploit an F-22 Raptor and put it down or change the targeting system or shoot the, 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 the wrong target or induce friendly fire. So I would like to know or heard about this during the discussion. That's an excellent point, and I thank you for bringing that up. I think that it's definitely an issue that needs to be considered and is part of kind of the sphere that we're, um, we're looking at here when we enter any kind of debate like this. So thank you. For, it's an excellent point. Thank you. Um, does any of you want to respond? I, it was more of a point than a question. If you, um, if you have a response, I would invite you to address it quickly, um, and then we're going to turn the floor to the gentleman here in the third row. Sim, é, eu vou tentar responder brevemente. É, eu acho que sim, é um campo. Eu acho que, inclusive, é um campo uh, uh, onde até bastante quantidade de tecnologia sendo desenvolvida. É, a gente tem uh, até, sei lá, um exemplo uh, simples. O, o, a gente tem até militares do Exército Brasileiro que trabalharam já num projeto de parceria com é, o Exército Americano. A gente, é, acho que ele é bem conhecido até no meio civil, que chama Márcio Moreira. Ele trabalhou num projeto de um, do chamado pulso eletromagnético. Né? Ele trabalhou num projeto de um canhão de pulso eletromagnético e um submarino, num projeto é, de pesquisa conjunto com os Estados Unidos. Então, assim, eu acho que é um tipo de tecnologia que precisa ser é endereçada dentro desse escopo e que, sim, ela fica meio, às vezes, não sendo tratada com a proeminência devida. Porém, até pegando um gancho é, no que foi comentado, ele uh, comentou que é uma questão de, é, é, de conscientização pública, porque, no final, essas decisões, a, minha, a impressão que eu tenho, que, no final, são decisões políticas, né? são decisões de um governo uh, que decide ou não tomar investimentos ou seguir determinados caminhos. E decisões políticas, em geral, há exceções, mas elas, em geral, são tomadas baseada uh, no que a população, em geral, pensa a respeito do tema, porque elas são tomadas tomadas baseadas em votos. Né? Então, eu acho que realmente existe um trabalho de conscientização que precisa ser feito, e porque a, não havendo essa conscientização, é, não são tomadas essas decisões. E o assunto mais discutido acaba sendo o outro. Por quê? Porque, minimamente, é um assunto que é mais fácil desse público em geral entender. Né? Por quê? Porque se a gente falar de tecnologia para atracar armas, nós estamos falando de coisas durante um período de combate, possivelmente, né? numa situação de combate. E se pegar o caso do Brasil, por exemplo, que é um país que praticamente 100 anos não se envolve numa guerra, então, de repente, discutir proteção da infraestrutura crítica faz mais sentido e, de repente, é mais entendido por esse público em geral. Então, essa é a minha opinião. Obrigado, Anderson. And, Andrew, você tem algum comentário para adicionar? The comment is that um, really just focus on the threat because that threat of redirecting weapons or you know, the, the actor that does that could be a, a government, it could be an individual. It's a threat that needs to be 
addressed. It's not, oh, uh, because uh, uh, it's, as Marcus Ranum says, uh, in, cyber warfare is only going to be used in a real war. <laughs> you know, so if, if a country goes and, and makes war on another country, then they might use some of these tactics. And that, that's a threat that needs to be, but that's a second order threat to the, to the war. The, the first order threat uh, is someone might do, some other actor, non-state actor might do this. Uh, and that's a, that's a threat and a management of that threat that needs to be con uh, considered independent of uh, a war. Thanks, Andrew. Um, the gentleman in here in the third row, if you'd come up. Thanks. Uh, I don't think I have a question, but uh, I would like to go back well, what you said about the public-private uh, partnership about uh, <coughs> security. And uh, I think here in Brazil, we have a lot of problems with politicians that are not really ethical. Uh, we have a lot of problems, or, or had, I don't know, uh, with corruption. And uh, many of them, I think most of them, don't, don't even know about technology, uh, information technology. So uh, they take decisions based on partnerships with other politicians and other uh, companies. And so many times they won't uh, buy uh, a product, they won't uh, put the, the programs in their data center or uh, to the hands of a, a company because it's the better for the country. But uh, m many times it's because it's better for their pockets. So I would like them to discuss a little about it. Thank, Thank you. you. So are you saying your politicians aren't ethical because we don't have that problem in the US? <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, no, I've, I've actually seen that in a couple cases where in the last year where um, well thought out, well detailed solutions or capabilities were suggested or recommended to, you know, something either a, through a CERT team uh, responding to an issue or some portion of a, a country's government and they, yeah, they turned it away because um, they either didn't, they thought it was too expensive and they didn't have any idea what they were paying for in the first place, so they had nothing to compare it to anyway, or uh, they just weren't ready to deal with, um, I guess, the solution. I never, I don't know if I ever saw one where it was completely a, uh, we're not going to buy this because it's going to not be good for my own pocketbook, but I definitely saw some decisions made that were, that didn't seem to make any sense because people didn't understand the issues. So I think that's, even outside Brazil, that's kind of universal in other locations. I don't know if that gives you any comfort. But. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. We're going to turn the mic over to Anderson. And again, let's try to keep this accelerated and quick so that we can maximize the number of questions we have from the audience. É, eu acho que toda vez que a gente discute qualquer assunto que envolva é, o, o governo ter que tomar proeminência num determinado tipo de iniciativa, é, é normal que a gente acabe esbarrando no assunto da corrupção, porque a gente sabe que ela existe e só não vê né, quem... Até cego vê, né, porque ouve também e fica sabendo a respeito. Então, o... o porém, é, é assim, por isso que eu dei uma ênfase que eu acho que é, realmente falta conhecimento. Então, de repente, deveria haver mais investimento para que esse conhecimento fosse desenvolvido lá. Porém, eu acho que no geral, cara, quando você vive num país democrático, os políticos eles representam ali uma decisão coletiva, entendeu? Existem uma série de distorções no sistema, mas no geral são pessoas que têm apoio popular, né? Você vai pegar o microfone e sair perguntando para as pessoas no Brasil inteiro como os institutos de pesquisa fazem, elas acham que o governo é excelente, né? Não estou falando, estou falando que os números que aparecem, né? Então, é... o... eu acho que a gente não pode deixar de fazer investimento numa coisa que a gente acredita importante, porque num determinado momento a gente sabe que esse dinheiro é, vai ser roubado. Por quê? Porque essa distorção política ela é uma manifestação do conjunto de coisas que são feitas nesse país e que todo mundo aceita, de certa forma. Porque a gente não está né, em guerra, não estamos tentando destituir o governo, não estamos matando político. E a história recente do Brasil mostra que esses métodos eles são independentes de partido. Entendeu? Que a, a, o sistema funciona igual, às vezes há alguma ordenação ideológica, mas funciona da mesma forma. Então, acho que se a gente acredita que é certo, que deveria haver isso, eu acho que a gente tem que é, lutar para que isso seja feito e 
para que a gente possa ter a moral de cobrar aqueles okay. que, de repente, têm esse tipo de distorção. Two, Eu acho que é por aí. Thanks, Anderson. Um, I'd like to invite the next question to come on up. And I just want to repeat, please feel free, anyone from the audience who wants to ask your question in Portuguese, we're happy to translate. So, in English or Portuguese. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, my question just, let's say, let's say someone has a database with uh, personal information like uh, social security number and driver license and all the shit from millions of Americans. Could this affect the government of the United States in, in some way? You are saying that because you have it? <laughs> no, 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 no. I, and I'm asking this for someone else. <laughs> so the question was driver's license, per social security number, and what other information? Zip code, address. Zip code. So basically, personally identifiable inf information, PPI. Uh, anybody from the panel want to take this? Philippe? Well, the first thing, it would be great for any kind of people who would want to push a new attempt of financing new services. Oh, look at this. A problem with security. We, we must always keep in mind that there's a visibility and a perception aspect to security. Uh, some things are used to scare people into voting new budgets, and some things are uh, really used in order to build real capabilities and uh, real defense. Um, you, you never know how it's going to be used, and of course, this is available somewhere. It has been, it will be in the future. Andrew, are you reaching for the microphone there? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't see that this would have any impact at all. Uh, there's, there's so much personal, personally identifiable information available on the internet today. I mean, let's just, let's just go ahead and talk about credit card numbers. I mean, it's the full deal, right? Credit card numbers with the number on the back, plus your social, plus your address, plus whatever else. You know, there's millions of those out there already today, and uh, it doesn't have any impact on the, on the government. So I'm not sure. Uh, why you're asking, whether you think that there's... Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh -huh. So I, I, I have a question. Andrew, you have a question. Yeah, how, how many people think that it was hackers that took down the power grid uh, you know, two weeks ago in uh, Rio and uh, Sao Paulo? That's a great question. Thanks, Andrew, for bringing that up. Can we have a show of hands? Who thinks that it actually happened? Did Espiritu Santo and Hugh, were those power outages caused by hackers? Raise your hand if you think yes. Was One? <laughs> Does anybody want to speak on behalf of um, Thunderbolts? <laughs> the official explanation was Thunderbolts. Yeah. Okay, so does anybody have the log of the system to basically know something? Because we are speaking. Because we are speaking in vacuum. Uh, we don't have any logs, any information, what's the disclosure of the government, what to try to blame some things on some people. Well, uh, usually what is interesting is evidence. What are the facts? Here it's all furs and people who have an opinion and want to get promoted by, say, by voicing it. Oh, come on. I mean. I think Eu vou só responder em inglês, de repente, porque um comentário em cima do que ele fez e ele está sem o... I, I was... Uh, I think that um, the reason... I, I don't know, perhaps this is my reason and perhaps I identify myself with a lot of people here. But I really think that when it comes to Brazil, there are a lot of things that we know that for having that happened, we don't need a hacker. You know, it's... <laughs> Uh, and uh, I, yeah, no, I, I understand what you're saying. I um, obviously that an specialist would never be able to say, considering the amount of information that we have for making this analysis, it's just an opinion, just a gut feeling, of course. But uh, 
And uh, I even, I, I've seen this a lot of times, not only in the um, uh, companies or governments, this type of problem. And I created a, a coin at a term, which is the incom incompetence attack. It's just what <laughs> makes, it's the, wor it's the worst type of attack that we have sometimes like here in Brazil. Thanks, Anderson. Actually, th there was something earlier uh, when you asked about uh, politicians. Uh, the thing that uh, the decision makers have to do is a uh, trade off all the time between the capability for execution, for delivery something good. So they question themselves is this person going to be able to provide me with defense, advice, insight, reverse engineering capabilities into some uh, critical piece of, uh, of equipment? Or are they biased? What, are, what is the trust that I can have in them? And it's always balancing between the two. So sometimes you feel weird choice, you, you don't understand that, but because they have some information about the trust that they can give to some vendor or not, or the, the knowledge that they know that they will be able to deliver, and some of the time, well, it feels really weird, but it's legitimate. Well, that doesn't prevent really weird stuff to happen, though. Yeah. Just, uh, just a very brief note. Uh, <coughs> we, uh, the Brazilian hackers are very into the scientific method. So when the problem happened and a lot of discussions started, there was a meme that I don't remember exactly who wrote it originally, but it was retweeted. Uh, for 100 people saying something like, okay, let's make this clear. If you put down the power grid, do it again today. I want to see it. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Josh, did you have any comments? Or I'd actually like to jump in and, and respond a bit to Andrew's point. Um, so I think that one question is, did this really happen? And that's kind of an independent question. Um, but there's another question for me. Um, I think that in the U.S., I, my research right now at iDefense focuses mostly on the U.S. And right now I'm focusing on government policy and the U.S. strategy uh, re evolve, like revolving around these issues. And I think that the 60 Minutes report that discussed these outages in Brazil, um, the main sources for that report were U.S. intelligence officials. They cited six U.S. intelligence officials. And as far as I could tell, they did not have any other sources other than the U.S. intelligence community. Um, iDefense actually participated in research on this. And as far as we could determine, um, if it did in fact happen, it's very likely that it was a foreign attack and it wasn't domestically generated. So that's one question. But apart from that, from that I think that there was a sort of a double agenda with that report and just about the discussion of these issues in the U.S. media and that is that the intelligence community and the U.S. military and the government in general are try trying to kind of raise the profile of these issues so that they can sort of focus government programs and defense issues on them. Um, the U.S. government's really scared about this right now. I just read a report that said that, um, for example, the the U.S. military and the Pentagon, for all of their critical missions, 85% of their critical missions depend solely on commercial power grids. So the defense community in and of itself is just really scared that they're vulnerable to attacks on SCADA systems on the private sector and so forth. And so I think that there was an agenda when the information about Brazil was leaked to the press, just about prioritizing this issue and raising the profile, bringing attention to it. Um, the next question was from Julio Cesar Fort, who has disappeared. Julio, are you here? Okay, Julio is not here, so I had a third person. If you want to come up, please. Bom, já que houve a oferta de tradução, eu vou vou recorrer a ela. Com prazer. Eu havia conversado com, com o Felipe no, no intervalo e uma outra questão que eu quis fazer, que me fugiu na hora, mas acho que até é pertinente aqui para o debate, uhum. já que a gente está falando de coisas relacionadas à segurança nacional e tal, o Brasil tem um projeto, bom, os compatriotas devem saber, do CIVAN, e na União Europeia 
houve um questionamento da França de talvez ter havido atividade do Ekelon, porque eles chegaram ao Brasil com propostas para nosso sistema de defesa, de monitoração da Amazônia e tal, e eles concorriam com uma empresa americana, uhum. era um leilão fechado, em que foi feita uma única oferta de cada um dos participantes, e a diferença de preço da oferta é, francesa para para a americana, que foi vitoriosa, era, é, foi perto de 1%, que normalmente acende a bandeirinha amarela, né? tipo, uh, foi muito próximo para para ser uma coisa casual. Os franceses já pa pareciam assustados, porque chegaram aqui e foram pegando pré-pagos em Carrefour, em lugares assim, que não vieram com aparelhos da, é, é, da Europa, só que eu não sei dizer como isso ocorreu na União Europeia. Porque, aparentemente, a França retirou a queixa, é isso que foi estranho. Mas eu não sei se ele tem mais informações ou algum outro participante. Foi uma questão muito longa, desculpa. Sim, yeah, that's going to be a question that's going to be a bit difficult to uh, consecutively interpret. Um, I'm actually going to ask for Anderson's help, if you could sum that up in a couple words. What was the question? Yeah. <coughs> Uh, we have a, a monitoring system in the Amazon forest that uh, uh, was built, like I think, around uh, eight years ago, six six to eight years ago, and it was obviously a, a huge government RFP in terms of money, like uh, I think that five billion dollars or so, and. Uh, There were uh, two, um, two, two governments bidding for helping in constructing that, uh, the French government and the American one, and uh, the, the yellow light was raised because the difference between, it was a closed RFP, uh, the people that came from France, they just uh, bought cell phones here in order to avoid tapping, detection and so on, and um, the difference between the two uh, bids made by the two governments was just 1%, and the Americans won uh, the RFP. And then there were some accusations that uh, the U.S. government might be used the Echelon system for obtaining uh, you know, information about this. So if you, he was asking if uh, you have more information on that or either one of you have like this. Yeah, you had access to this classified file. No, but, uh, but uh, probably, <laughs> no, just. Yeah, no, but I think it's more for the French side and it's... Yeah, uh, Philippe, if you would, as our uh, European representative, um, I think that you and the, the question, um, you had a previous conversation, but if you could address that here. Okay, so uh, uh, first you must differentiate between different kind of what we call warfare. Uh, there's a huge difference between cyber warfare that was presented before, electronic warfare, which is basically affecting weapons. That was a question of the gentleman who asked an earlier question about disabling arms using electronic means, and that's something very old. It dates from the 1950s. And economical warfare, which is the point you're raising. And economical warfare is uh, no uh, secret for the community. There are schools to teach economical warfare. Yeah. I'm sorry? E Ecole de Guerre Economique, uh, for example. I must disclose here that I was a teacher at Ecole de Guerre Economique. <laughs> um, and then, uh, basically, uh, the things that happen is that it's no, nothing really secret. It's uh, standard intelligence that are applied by each of these governments, and the French saying, oh, we've been spied on, are exactly doing the same, like any, any government. It's no secret that each of these governments, like the developed, the so-called civilized uh, countries, each of them is paying on each other, and each are promoting the economy that is under their control, and that's, definitely is the name of the game. Uh, for the economic, the problem is that it's not acknowledged. And so you're supposed to be playing at a fair, in a fair competition, whereas it's not at all the case. So I would say on this spe special case, oh, so bad, the French lost. Well, guess what? On some other thing, they won, but the problem is very often a lot of these Uh, countries who have capabilities for uh, this econo uh, economic warfare won against countries which didn't have these capabilities. So the problem really is here the asymmetry 
of the conflict. Uh, and uh, this economical warfare is asymmetry, there's asymmetry in also the, the attacks. All this question here, it's not did they do it, did they not do it, but it's much more who does it with the capability to do economic warfare and who doesn't have it. Simple. I, I would just make a further comment there, back to, uh, it's the, the theme that I've been talking about today, which is focus on the threat. So this threat of industrial espionage, it can happen at the state level, it can happen at the large enterprise level, but I've heard of this happening as well at the small business level. So here's a, here's a plumbing company that is bidding on an RFP, and it's for, I don't know, $50,000. And the brother-in-law of the owner knows enough to be able to go and pwn the <laughs> poor competitor and wins by, you know, it's $1,000 or something. Uh, so the, the point is, today, even individuals and low-skilled attackers have access to the technology to perform those threats. And so, uh, again, this is why uh, private organizations are interested in this, and I think it's also why individuals are interested in helping address these kinds of uh, threats. Excellent, thanks Andrew. Um, anybody on the panel have anything to add, or should we turn to the audience for another question? Okay, great, if you'd come up please, and again, you feel free to ask in English or Portuguese. Como o inglês não é muito bom, eu vou estar falando em português. É, o Echelon, por ele ser uma rede de espionagem, ele pode estar é, capturando informações é, privilegiadas que possam fazer com que, por exemplo, hidrelétricas deixem de transmitir energia, com que é, a estrutura de um país seja abalada. É, fundamentalmente, o Echelon é, sim, na minha visão, uma arma muito poderosa dos governos que fazem parte desse projeto. É, essa é a minha visão. Eu não sei de vocês. Eu gostaria muito de saber. Thank you. Um, again, Anderson, I'm going to ask you for your help as a representative Brazilian on the panel. Okay. Um, he was saying that. Uh, <coughs> In, uh, in his view, uh, the echelon, um, I've been living in Germany, so it's echelon there. It's uh, the echelon system. It's, uh, it's a real powerful tool for uh, those countries that are uh, supporting the development of the, uh, this tool. And that this tool could actually be used for uh, intercepting uh, uh, classified information, sensitive information that could lead to a number of threats, including uh, infrastructure threats like stopping power plants and, and so on. And, uh, and, uh, and, and he, state, he stated that this is his opinion and he would like to hear about your points of view on that if somebody would like to make a point. Andrew. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about Echelon, uh, but I'm going to go back to the, the theme again. Uh, today, the capability exists through open sources that provide intelligence that uh, a, 10 years ago or 20 years ago was only available to states that had significant uh, money to invest. So let's just take a look at satellite imagery. You had to launch a satellite into space in order to do that. Today, you can just go to Google Maps. You can get a street level view of whatever. You know, today, you know, let's not even bother talking about classified information. If you want to find classified information, just go Google it. <laughs> just go use Bing and you'll find so much freaking classified information out there, it's just not even funny. You do not, you know, to pull off 80% of the attacks, you don't need access to those systems. Yeah, just a comment. Just pass the mic. Imagine when you have access. <laughs> is that why Microsoft is developing a Bing search engine? <laughs> <laughs> That's a competitive response. Yeah. 
No, I, I would say that uh, yes, this happened, but imagine what those people that have access to this type of technology are able to find as well much more. It's, um, yeah, but I think that uh, you were pointing that uh, what is important is to, we have very urgent things happening all around you, all around everybody that you should be addressing as well, right? Yeah. So do you remember uh, a year ago at Christmas time, I think, there were riots in uh, Greece, in Athens. And the, uh, if you want to call them anarchists, you, but the, the rioters uh, used the technologies that are freely available to outwit the police. So they used Google Maps, they used Twitter, they used uh, the other social media, uh, the social, uh, tools available today to say, let's go meet here. Avoid this place because that's where the police are hanging out. You know, the, uh, again, if you think back to the attacks in Mumbai, uh, those technologies were used by motivated attackers uh, with, uh, uh, and you can see the results were, uh, <laughs> Right, Andrew, that's a very good point. I would bring up also that I know from my experience studying the U.S. intelligence agencies that part of their agenda, based on the result that they're looking for, they're, they will either try to enable or disable technologies like that. So, for example, um, disabling SMS messages so that, for example, attackers in Mumbai could not use SMS to to communicate. So there, there's the other side. There's the technologies that enable those things, and then there's another side that is pushing it. For example, I think the United States government was very interested in enabling Twitter-type communication in Iran to enable um, the the opposition to to push their points during the Iranian election and on the other side to disable those technologies when they're against an agenda. Um, we have time for one more question and um, I'm gonna I want to have a diversity of, of questions and Alan here has a question so if you'd come up please I'm sorry. Okay I have I think two questions. The first question is, which country today is best well positioned to deal with cyber warfare matter, if <laughs> there is one? And the, if this is the best approach to create a cyber czar, cyber army, or instead of that, the government should try to make uh, the whole companies more secure, because if they have a company from power plant, for our power plant secure, the government will stay more secure because they will have energy, so they will not need to have a cyber army. So maybe we are trying to do something very well complicated, establish a cyber army or whatever, because we need just to make companies more secure. I'd like to hear about European and American Brazilian opinions. Thanks, Alan. That's a very polemic question followed by a very good point. <clears throat> Best positioned. Wow, that's, um, it's dependent on so many things. One of the things I realized in working in and around small countries in Europe is that, you know, for a few million dollars you can get things up to speed pretty quick because their infrastructure is so small. Whereas a country like the U.S., you know, trying to secure everything that we've got in place is an extremely expensive, daunting task. So it really depends on you know, the size of the country, how much infrastructure do they have, um, what do they want to protect, you know, there's, uh, it, I, don't, I don't know if I've come across one that was so far and above any of the others. Um, but there are some countries uh, that are more wired, I guess, than others. Their governments are aware of what's going on and they're um, better positioned than others, but it's really, it's such a sliding scale because there's so many, so many factors built into something like that where you, you put one so far above the others, but. Um, so what you'll say. Uh, if you could use the mic so that our interpreters could follow. So uh, if I understand well, from a cost benefit pers analysis perspective, the US and any big country has a much better interest to invest in offensive power than in defensive power. Is that it? Uh, 
I don't know if that's what I'm saying. I'm just saying that they, because his question was, who is best positioned? Which country is best positioned? And it's just, uh, yeah, uh, best position, best sorry, best position to to initiate attack or best position to defend an attack. With the with the matter as a whole, for example, for cyber warfare, okay, the United States have uh, established a cyber, non cyber, mm -hmm. whatever, and we have conscious that we don't hear uh, so much uh, about it. For example, uh, I don't hear about. Uh, Japan talking about this, this issue, mm -hmm. but we heard a lot of uh, European, European countries talking about that in the United States. And which of this culture uh, had uh, are more best position in deal with the problem, but uh, don't talk, uh, for example, Christian said the government officials of the United States say, oh, let's shut down the SMS system. Okay, this is not a good approach because we have people that use their SMS. Mm -hmm. So, in my vision, this is not best. This, this official is not well positioned in this matter because he just went up to turn off and okay, the thing is resolved. So, the countries the country that have uh, a coalition that makes more sense for people who know Alan, I don't. I, I have to say, I don't think you're going to get an answer to this question. <laughs> it, it's more of a, a point. Um, it's a very good question, but it's just it, it's incredibly polemic, and I'm not sure that there there is a such thing as best practices in cyber warfare. And, and, I, and I think it goes back to what uh, Philip said earlier, which was most of these places they're still in the very nascent stages of trying to figure out what that means. They, they got some defensive stuff, some people, you know, they got some idea of what it means to defend, but offensive, a lot of times they're still trying to figure out what's what, and they're, um, it's so early on they don't even know what capabilities they want or don't want. Yeah, that's true. There's two points I want to bring up really quickly, um, just my thoughts on your question, Alan. Um, the first is that I think that an interesting data point for me when I think about these things is the level of control that governments have in the private sector. So when we look at, for example, a country like China, where the state is deeply, deeply involved in the private sector, if you can e even call it that, and I think that that level of control over companies enables China to push its, its strategic and defense agenda through the private sector. So that's a very different situation from, for example, the United States, where the private sector is relatively autonomous and the government and the private sector are quite separate. And so the US doesn't really have a whole lot of control or say other than uh, kind of typical regulation over what companies are doing with regards to these issues. So that's a really interesting data po point for me is to what extent does the government have control in the private sector and how are they pushing their defense strategy through the private sector. Um, and the second point that I want to bring up just to respond to your question is um, I was at a briefing for an intelligence agency in the US and we had a very interesting conversation. Um, there was one question during the briefing and it was what do the Chinese think of US cyber war capacities. And um, I was first of all shocked to hear that at the briefing the attendees were asking the question. Um, perhaps it was a head check for them, but nonetheless, um, they were very surprised to hear that the Chinese thought that the US was very far ahead of them. And the Chi I mean, the Chinese were actually, they're they were very surprised to hear that the U.S. only stood up its cyber command starting in October. It reached initial operating capacity. That was quite shocking for the people who were developing the Chinese strategy. So I thought that was interesting. Any further comments from the panel? Andrew, you looked like you had something to say. Go ahead, Jonathan. Jonathan, come on up. <laughs> we're going to have last words in a minute. We have to close. I, I thought very interesting what you just said about China and uh, uh, the private sector because, uh, um, I mean, as far as I know, Ashland today, I mean, it's been developed like uh, during the Cold War and stuff, but uh, 
there is some evidence that it's used nowadays mostly for uh, 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 economy, economical intelligence, right? Like uh, if you take the Airbus versus uh, Boeing case and stuff like that, there is clearly inference of, uh, I mean, a uh, 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 private sector and governments, right? So just to moderate a bit. Yeah, no, uh, that's a good point. Thank you for bringing it up. Thank you. Uh, uh, I just wanted to, to, uh, to, to ask you uh, if you have any evidence of the existence of cyber warfare. Because apart from the uh, Estonia case that has been, I mean, pretty mediatized, uh, is there any evidence that such a thing exists? Or is this just a myth to, uh, uh, it's a real question to uh, um, hide the fact that actually all this intelligence is actually uh, um, toward it, um, t uh, I mean, used precisely for uh, economical warfare, which I know does exist. Yeah, no, that's a, um, Jonathan, thank you for my, your point, and that's a really, um, it's a really great point to bring up. I think that a lot of times the, the economic strategy is, comes first before a defense strategy. And of course, in the Chinese case, a lot of the intelligence that they're acquiring and all the information that they acquire is often used not for really defense, it's, it's for economic advantage. It's, it's a very important point, and I thank you for bringing that up. Um, I'm forgetting your second question. Do you have any evidence of cyber warfare? Um, I'll let my pan the panelists address that question. Uh, my personal opinion is that we have not seen a sort of a cyber act of war. It may or may not ever happen, but in my opinion, we haven't seen one yet. Um, I can think of hypothetical examples that maybe we can discuss later, but uh, in my opinion, we haven't seen anything yet. And I'd like to turn that question to the panel. Thank you for being very honest about that. Uh, actually, uh, here, uh, I think your, your question is a point. Maybe one question focuses the attention of a community toward a sector where people don't pay attention to another sector, so it might be a tactic. Um, now I have a question for you guys and girls. Basically, <laughs> I'm very shocked to be speaking about very like uh, abstract context where uh, actually in our sector we are witnessing a turn of the disclosure of weapon, little weapon, let's say exploit, um, from a full disclosure approach which was free and really a competitive research toward a marketplace that tend to separate people into players who want to get money for their discovery and then makes uh, the full disclosure recess in favor of obscurity and creates a delta of time during which uh, some infrastructure can be attacked with this exploit. This is not theoretical, this is very concrete and basically people have questioned uh, this theory that NSA was buying each of the technological product to find one attack per product or several attack per product for decades, for, for tens of years. So my question to you is why is this question not coming up during this because to me it really relates to what we are talking here. Does anybody want to respond quickly? I would emphasize that, um, make it very short, because we need to turn the, the mic back over to Rodrigo to close the event. I, I'm, I'm not going to respond to Philippe's question, although do, I do think that's a very interesting one, but uh, to Jonathan, uh, maybe the question is not important. Uh, a different question or different response is that there is actually uh, no uh, agreed upon definition of what a cyber act of war actually is. So, I mean, there's good definitions of what an act of war is and what, a, what an appropriate response is, if you think about that from a traditional standpoint. There's, you know, uh, Marianne Davidson was quoted in the, you know, nine months ago or a year ago as saying that that's an act of war, you know, some of the intrusions. <laughs> really? So there isn't, and I, and I think that uh, governments struggle with, uh, is, do we actually, are we really going to call that an act of war that, that then requires that, or uh, requires that kind of a response? There, there's no consensus there. So that's kind of the difficulty as well. Yeah, it's a very difficult question. Um, Just very briefly, uh, my answer is no. I, I, I never see any evidence 
uh, I think, of course, the definition of the term is really important, so you can just frame exactly what this type of evidence should be. But using just the perhaps the usual definition, uh, I've never seen, and uh, uh, I've worked with a lot of different institutions, and something that I learned, uh, a not technical aspect of what I learned from those organizations is that, at least in Brazil, this type of hierarchical organization where you have people like 65 years old uh, rolling the whole organization, you know, it, it's not a, a, a prejudice, it's, but it's the fact that they are really, really slow in order sometimes to respond to those things. This is the impression that I have, at least to the Brazilian army. The impression that I have with the Brazilian army, when we see the agenda and the discussions, is that they, they didn't get it yet. You know, it's, but I think it's due to the type of you know, internal organization they have, I think that uh, that's my opinion. Okay, um, just for the, the sake of kind of uniformity here, Josh, do you have any uh, anything you'd like to add or sh are we ready to close? I, the only thing I was gonna add is, you know, if something did happen like that, it's really a question of attribution, which is, I mean, you don't have to be an expert to, to cover your tracks on something like that. And even in the, stu the stuff we've seen in the news, the Estonia, Georgia, those type of things, Everybody suspects what and who was behind it, but there's no way to prove it because two hops outside of the router, it's, you know, you don't, what can you prove? So. Thanks, Josh. That's a very good point. Um, so we're going to close the debate. I thank you all for participating. Your questions were excellent. Um, I'd like to have a round of applause for our panelists. They were great. And also a round of applause for the organizers of the conference. <laughs>